Hello and welcome to another episode of One on One right here on PLOS TV Africa. On this episode, we would be reviewing Nigeria's agriculture space, which was once our major source of revenue before the discovery of oil. Now, according to statistics, Nigeria's population is bound to expand to nearly 400 million by 2050. Hence, it is imperative to ensure strategic investment and empowerment goes into the agricultural sector to avail crop variety to farmers amongst others. I have with me in the studio African farmer Mogaji, the chairman agriculture and agro Light group at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Fantastic to have you in the studio. Thank you. I was taken aback when I saw or heard your first name, <laughs> African farmer. How did that come about? <laughs> about 15 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I caught a vision. Okay of um, having agribusinesses across Africa. Mm -hmm. So when you have a farmer in Nigeria, he's a Nigerian farmer, Zimbabwe farmer, Kenyan farmer. So when you have a farmer that has businesses across Africa, becomes an African farmer. So mm -hmm. I went to change my name legally and um, I've been African farmer since. And I reckon you always get this, because when I, I said, no, <laughs> where's his first name in all of this? There's Mogaji, but where's the first name? All right, but what happened? Did farming find you or you found farming? What happened to what? I think we discovered each other. Okay, tell me about it I and started, how the experience was I started was pretty being. early okay. um, in my primaries. Mm. Yeah, so I started with, with the old chicks. My mom used to, I grew up in Ibadan. So my mom used to make clothes and there was this company called Al Alanco. Uh, there are no more. Mm. Uh, so they sell the old chicks directly opposite. So by the time I got into my secondary school, I now went to... I bought out of my pocket money and I began to rear the chicken and um, it, it grew a bit. Then I went into rabbit tree, I went mm -hmm. into guinea pigs, those are like rats, but mm -hmm. white and black. And um, by the time I was finishing secondary school, I had guinea pigs, rabbits, um, chickens, I had cassava in my dad's wow. farm in Ekiti, and I had yams. Mm. And so. We, we, we found each other and I've been hooked since. So I actually started my <laughs> first investment in 1987 when uh, it was, I think, about two, three weeks after late uh, Baba Olowo was buried. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, this is a very fantastic, you know, start. <laughs> but what, how would you describe youth participation in agriculture here in Nigeria? I think it needs to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, the youth needs to see more role models, uh, people who have started and have achieved some measure of significance. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say success, but significance. So they can have some people to model after um, as against the pictures that they are used to. They are used to the rural farmers. Uh, they are used to uh, many youths uh, uh, whose parents were or are uh, graduates of agriculture working mm -hmm. in the ministry, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. different parastatals. They've not seen anything good out of it. Mm. They've not seen their, the ambience around where their parents work. It's not so good. They don't have good it's chairs. It's not fancy. It's not fancy. Mm -hmm. So they all detest it. So many of them don't want to go into agriculture. Mm -hmm. And when they get eventually, you know, there's this way that God has it, that um, most of them end up back in agriculture and they don't want their children to go into agriculture. So the, the youths need to be really encouraged. Um, however, we have some a lot of uh, influx of people, youths who didn't study agriculture. Mm, mm. And so it's the youths that didn't study agriculture that are, that are into agriculture, agriculture you know, doing really well mm. in the sector. We need to have a structure mm. for youths. We need to focus on them. Mm -hmm. If not, the uh, agri, agri sector is unlike other sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, sectors is nature dependent and requires a lot of networking and, and linkages. So um, a lot of youths currently look at agriculture as if for them it's fancy but really when it comes to the numbers the number is not adding up for them okay so if we don't have that structure that incentive uh, system uh, then many of them will not be in the sector again all right let's talk about the population expansion i did mention at the beginning of this that by 2015 we should be expecting a population of about 400 million mm -hmm. now that's a lot when you juxtapose it with the current situation of our nation's um food security index yeah. it's the ratio is quite you know large what's your take on that especially when it comes to our ratio of imports to e exports in the country 
Yes, um, we have quite a bit of uh, challenge with uh, import export, but really, it's it's not it's not anything I'm really worried about because we have the willing populace who wants to get into the sector. Uh, currently, we have a government also that is proactive. So I don't see that challenge, especially if the agencies working on that government can really do their job. So yes, the population is going to increase. Currently, we are importing. And uh, the new pronouncement by the president not to allow the CBN give FX effects to uh, companies importing, mm -hmm. you know, has come with mixed feelings. Um, which is, is it good or bad or is it neutral? Do we have the potential to feed the uh, around 200 million population that we have here in Nigeria? We actually have the potential. We have what is required. We only need the integration and collaboration from most of these agencies. Yes, the president has been, has been talking about corruption. Uh, we need him to pay attention to agri sector and there will be a lot of discovery. You know, so uh, we have what it takes. We have the lands, we have the body of water, we have the irrigation facilities. You know, if you are well traveled, you would know that we really don't have any issue. The issue is administration, integrating things together. There are dams, we don't have, food scarcity shouldn't arise in Nigeria. We're over -pro -pro -produ producing in some areas and but the question also in, in the field, yes, we are producing like tomatoes. Mm -hmm. However, we're not producing quality tomatoes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you produce garbage in excess, it's still garbage. So while we say tomato is wasting because of um, road network and co, we need to encourage more small cottage industries, which Malaysia uh, has done. So let me paint this scenario. When Nigeria, contrary to the conversation around that Malaysia, the Malaysians came to Nigeria to pick palm, uh, palm nuts to go and grow in Malaysia, that's not right, but it's been going on for years. So after we got independence and Malaysia also got independence from the British colony, they were looking at um, a product that could unite us and also that they could continue to import in their country to sustain their uh, factories. So what did they do? They now brought Malaysians to Nigeria to develop a variety called Tenera. Okay. So it was a joint effort between Malaysia and Nigeria, and that's what we, is planting, planted across the globe now. And so while Nigeria now focused on big machines to do massive production, Malaysians got back and they invested and set up more small and medium scale. So over time, it was sustainable. For us, it wasn't sustainable because we were in, when economy had issues, we weren't able to match up. So Malaysia now has gotten into that massive scale while the massive scale is not working for us and we don't have those small and medium. So yes, we can turn things around in record time. Mm. The most important thing around here is that the spirit of a Nigerian is huge. Now, when you say in record time, mm -hmm. because at this point, off the top of my head, I'm saying to myself, the short-term effect of such a policy is that at some point, there will be less for more people to feed on, mm -hmm. which may also bring about inflation. Yes. So, so at the end of the day, the common man on the streets are the ones that would be affected by this policy short-term. You see, when I say record time, there are two clear and present challenges coming up. By the time the 30,000 Naira is implemented, the food prices is what will skyrocket first. So the 30,000 Naira will not take anybody home again. Now, considering uh, climate change also coming on board, as in, in uh, the rains are not falling when you need them, you know, so when you put all those together, the policy also will create some scarcity because it's not imported again, and so we need to look at it internally. So we're likely to have three things coming together at the same time. However, we already have the infrastructure required. So we need the minister 
to really go and do what he is employed to do. No analysis. Tell us what you want to do, how we want to do it, how the private sector should come in because the infrastructure is available. Mm. The irrigation, the dams, they ir have moved around this country. I've thought a lot. And, and I tell you that we have the infrastructure. Now we know that the Central Bank of Nigeria has come about um, some interventions for the farmers. Is it in line with the current reality of what farmers actually need to expand? Yes, so uh, I've started this conversation around we need to have a look, a rethink about who we call a farmer. Okay. To be able to be, to be sustainable, to be able to feed ourselves. Now, the average farmer in the rural suburbs is average of 60 years. Mm. So, almost all this, and I've seen it, I, I give, you know... Uh, I mean, I call you a field farmer because you're <laughs> always on the field, I'm, right? I'm always on the field. <laughs> You see, uh, the, the farmers have been betraying bulk of this um, incentive and intervention. I know it's not a common conversation. People will say, criticize you, but they, they're not in the villages. They don't go there. So bulk of these things, these farmers sell it. Many people will call it um, poverty. No, I call it attitude because we funded quite a lot also out of goodwill and passion but they don't pay attention. They will sell this thing. So many of the farmers are even betraying CBN's trust. So because so CBN doesn't give them monetary, you know, yes, tokens. They Why don't give them. It? Yeah, you see, when they were giving them money, they weren't getting results. Now that they are giving them the best quality input, they are selling it at the price. And when you say input, seedlings, seeds, fertilizers, water pumps. You know, okay. I, I saw one in a state, top notch, top of the heart very expensive uh, quality water pumps. They were selling it for half of the price. They collect it and sell it out. So we need to begin to change the conversation around who should we term a farmer now? Who should we be looking at? We should be looking at the youths. I call two youths. The graduate youth, who is, ex who is educated, exposed, exposed and is looking at a better future, wants to be able to go on vacation, so any incentive, so it's not longer we give fertilizer, seed, and co for two and a half acres. That won't cut it for a, a young graduate. We should need to be looking at five hectares. By the way, this is not rocket science. It had happened 30, 35, 30, within 30 years ago when you had the river basins where they were giving a farmer four hectares. Mm. Uh, that's about 12.5, almost 12.5 acres of land. And government came in to cultivate and co. Okay. So we need to look at all the second group that I call forgotten experts. Who are the forgotten experts? They are youths in the rural communities who grew up with their fathers going to farm. Mm. They know this value chain in and out, but they don't know best practices again. But the graduate of agriculture today doesn't know best practice on paper but when it gets to the food, cannot do so. We need to integrate this and focus on these people because they are aspirational in their approach and leave a bit. So if they want, if there's any intervention or incentive that is 100%, give 50 to the rural farmers, as in the elderly ones, and bring together these new people who you can still groom. And right. that's where we need to pay attention to. Now, there's also the challenge of storage, mm. which... Um, is a major concern. Yes. I believe if there's no storage facility for your products, it would definitely eat into your profit margin. Yes. What is the situation around that now? Yes, we don't have storage across board. Um, take, for instance, for grains, um, for corn, millet, sorghum, so you know, those grains that I ideally would keep better than any of the tomatoes, sweet potatoes. Our silos are there, they are still empty. And I stand to be corrected. Oh. Bulk of our silos are still empty. And so what that means is that part of this uh, in incentives is, should not just be around, we give you inputs to produce. Should be, if it's a $1 billion uh, intervention fund, it should be that 50 million out of the $500 million should be going into storage. 
So it can actually bypass. regulate if there's about to be a scarcity or not via the silos. Yeah, so mm. if the silos are filled, we, we have a clear and present challenge with us or danger. If we have, if the rains do not fall for four months or three months, we are not sure that we'll be able to respond to it because bulk of these grains are not in the silos. The silos, the national reserves are meant to house these things for periods when you have challenges. So we need more silos. But most importantly, I, I think a more proactive approach to that is to have um, intervention funds to support small and medium scale mm. cottage to process it, to add value immediately, because it takes power. Mm. And once you don't have power, the moment you add you transform the state, you prolong it. And it's the small and medium that can take advantage of that. All right, we'll hold on for a bit. We will take a quick break now. You're still watching One on One on Plus TV Africa. I've been speaking with African farmer Mogaji. Thank you for staying with us. We've been speaking with African farmer Mogaji. All right. Let's take a look at the mechanized farming mm. space and technology in terms of farming. How well are we doing? We're not doing well. Mm. Um, most of the interventions um, around agriculture, because government is the biggest spender, is still targeted at a rural farmer. Um, and the rural farmer, the things they give out are not anything mechanization. The component of mechanization is still very small. So they still expect the farmers to carry the knapsack on their bags. There's a place for that. But when we are looking at uh, feeding Nigeria, and I think when we begin to look at feeding Nigeria, I think it's very myopic. Because the whole of West Africa depends on Nigeria, especially in the grains value chain. So when we are planning, we need to be pl not planning for 200 million, but we need to add the population of Cameroon, Niger, you know, and our neighboring countries, we need to add them into it. So we don't plan well when we plan for Nigerians. Alone. We need to increase our yield. We need to increase our yield and have them. Because when they come, when they have challenges, uh, climate change, they move to Nigeria, offer better prices, and move those products back. And we now begin to shout here. So we need to embrace mechanization. We need to look at, um, in Asia now, mm -hmm. if we want to copy or adopt anything, it should, we should just go to Asia because they, they, the sector is developed around small older farmers and many of them, yes, a, a large number still use animals, but many of them use two-wheel tractors, something that you can move. The same tractor, you use it to move your products, you will use the same tractor to irrigate, you will use it to spray, you use it for a lot of functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it makes, it removes drudgery out of it. So we're not focusing on, on that. And we are also f distracted with trying to be like the US or Europe, getting heavy equipment. When the Europeans and the Americans are looking at small equipments now, but they don't have a choice, they're looking at how can we do organic and co. We are trying to copy what they are trying to run away from. So we need to look at what technology works best for us. And so we need to take advantage of the small advantage, small order advantage that we have. So we're not technology, we're not embracing technology. However, uh, and it seems as if I'm, I'm ringing the bell of uh, CBN, <laughs> but I've been around 24 years plus now, and I, I'm seeing technology. Take for instance the Anchor Boras program. They are embracing technology there. So what used to happen is the farmer, um, gets uh, the intervention, another farmer comes to use the same land to try and access intervention. But right now, they do geomapping. So they take the map and put it online. So when another farmer puts that coordinate, they only need to punch it and find no. So they, they are embracing technology there. Fantastic. But we drones, we have security challenges. So Embracing drones is a challenge, but drones will actually help us in terms of monitoring, mapping, survey, instead of running around with one gadget, 
you know, just fly a drone around and, and you have done the job. You can use drones to see, uh, monitor crops for pest invasion. So the places you will not see, the drones will capture it. So, we, you know, we need to embrace a lot of technology, soil tests, soil mapping. We are not talking about those value chain of uh, leveraging technology that will make this job easier and scientific. Mm -hmm. Agriculture now is more precision. It's more like 95% science and less than even 5% real doing the work. So we, there's room for technology. If I, there, there's so much. I've done quite a bit of tour around uh, develop, developed and developing countries this year. And I've seen what technology is doing there. And it's something and we can impact embrace. impact on the agricultural sector yes. in those regions. Yeah, you, a lot of, you detect a lot of things mm -hmm. using technology. So I think we need to, the moment we shift to that, we stop these small older farmers. The small older farmers are very intelligent people. They will catch up. But the moment we still stay at their level, they stay there. But the moment you set your vision, there's no visioning. If the minister comes in here and says, this is what I want to do, nothing can stop me, we're going to get it done, mm -hmm. this is the result. The farmers who are lying, they are in cooperatives, even though those cooperatives are shaky, but they are in cooperatives and you will find the, the early adopters amongst them. And once that is done, but we need to pay attention to technology. What's the situation of the cooperative se you know, sector here in Nigeria, especially when it comes to agriculture? Now, um, there's this, and most of the cooperatives, agric-based cooperatives, most of them are resident um, in the rural areas, and it's all this, it's still an undoubt oh, cooperative. Oh, okay. Okay. They are waiting for government to do something. So the cooperative is not functioning outside uh, interventions coming. They may come to meet, but there's, it's just what intervention is coming, but then there's, there's no think tank. Okay, okay. So uh, we're not having those cooperatives really finding um, solving problems. So 2017, the USDA, United States Development uh, Agency for Development of Agriculture, um, took me on a training in the US. And we went to uh, 18 different cooperatives. The oldest was 149, the youngest was 49. And guess what? They don't do what we do here. The cooperatives come together to solve a problem. So the farmers can sell milk. So some farmers say, well, let me stop, let's stop dairy, let's stop producing cows for milk. Let's start selling milk. And so they form a cooperative to sell milk. Like we have the retail big shops in Nigeria. So they are leaving the production to marketing. Yes. So that means that instead of one million of us into production, they drop it by 500,000, 500,000 go into value addition of marketing. Mm. So those people can increase their productivity. And you know, so poultry also in Colorado, three companies sell all the poultry that, is, that they produce. So we need to change the dynamics of the cooperatives. So water corporation in Northern Colorado, water corporation is owned by some cooperative farmers. So they moved out of core farming to look at the value chain disturbing the farmers. And that building that ecosystem has actually improved agribusiness. Mm. And so when you check all these things, they're 49 years old and 149 year old, they're looking at cooperative from a different perspective than taking loans. They are okay, okay. adding value. And that's how we need to do it now. And finally, on the issue of value addition, mm. because I reckon we have a lot of raw agricultural products, yeah. but then we still have issues around making them into finished products, because at the end of the day, that's where the bulk of the profits would come from when you're giving out or exporting finished goods. Yeah. Um, happily and recently, too, we have most of the youths in the urban, urban space. Um, going into agriculture, are going into value addition. And you will see things like Kuli Kuli, that's granite uh, snack. You will see a lot of packaging. The packaging, you can pick it up and export. However, they are struggling. So, but right now, in like the last seven, eight years, the best packaged um, agri-produce 
is has happened then and the youths are doing it so but many of them are also getting weary and tired but who was causing the weariness yeah because the cost of their production is high okay so interventions all over the world many of the farm many of the countries don't no longer fund or support production many because they've supported it for some time and moved into value addition and export so they would like in the u.s now they would pay the farmer to take out of the crop and put it in the reserve so you they pay they, they compensate for harvest not production mm. so what that means is that you would have access to more produce to process so if you're not buying equipment yourself and you take a facility for and the facility is accessible that's where boi comes in so boi for small scale is very crucial now but we have improved a lot and we need to now scale that but it's the youths that are coming in and it's a welcome development all right thank you very much that's all we can take at this point but thank you so much for joining me thank this you for evening. having thank me. you african farmer <laughs> Thank you for staying with us on this episode. For more content of this nature, do subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa and on other social media platforms on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn. You can also follow me on, on my social media handles at Ubani Irene.